this is the Coffee with the Geek program. It is October, close to Halloween in 2020. We are still in the middle of the pandemic. We're hopefully, we're going to come out of it any day, right? <laughs> um, with me today is a really amazing guest, and I came across Tim Needles through the ISTE, uh, the ISTE uh, collaboration, the PLN. So that's where I first saw you, Tim, and that took me to your website, and that took me to your book, and that took me to all kinds of awesome things. So uh, I, I just can't wait to talk to you. And I, I felt, I said this before, as, as the pandemic was first hitting, and I think as a general statement, I've always said, you know, in times of trouble and strife, seek comfort in the arts, and that's when the arts really come to life and bring us, um, first of all, creativity and innovation, but also just, I think, comfort. So I, I thought it was per the perfect time to, to talk to you. So Tim, let me first introduce you. You are an artist, educator, and author now, um, and your book is Steam Power, Infusing Art into Your Steam Curriculum. I'd love to talk a lot about that. Uh, you are a TEDx speaker, and your work has been featured on, are you ready for this, NPR, New York Times, Columbus Museum of Art, Norman Rockwell Museum, Alexandria Museum of Art, Katana Museum of Art, Cape Cod Museum of Art. You've got to be really proud. Those are some amazing institutions to have your work showcased, so congratulations on that. Um, you are the uh, recipient of ISTE's Technology in Action Award and Creativity Award, the NAEA's AET Outstanding Teacher Award, the Rauschenberg Power of Art Award, National Geographic Certified Teacher, PBS Digital Innovator, ISTE Arts and Technology and STEM PLN Leader. For those art folks out there, you need to be a part of this PLN. Uh, the NAEA Art Ed Tech Interest Group Leader, and Adobe Creative Educator and Education Leader Emeritus. And you can be found on uh, social media through just at Tim Needles, and your main website is just timneedles.com. So you it, yeah. Tim, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. I didn't ask you, but uh, I'll throw it out there to you. Are you a coffee drinker and do you have a favorite blend? I am a big coffee drinker. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> of course. I mean, it's hard to be a teacher and not be a coffee drinker. I think, <laughs> I think so. Um, so, you know, this year with the pandemic, I've actually switched to having iced coffee every day. So I, I'll, I, I'm a big Starbucks fan. So I, I get my iced coffee at Starbucks and I'll buy four or five at a time. So now I could just, you know, have one ready in the morning just in case. <laughs> I loved iced coffee too, but I'm, I'm particular. It's kind of summertime, it has, has to be summer. And then I switch back over, but yeah, I love it. And you can't go wrong with, with Starbucks. So let me just start off first. Uh, your Smithtown School District in Long Island. How are, how are you holding up uh, personally and professionally through this time of pandemic? Well, it's pretty interesting. I mean, like, um... Uh, we've had a lot of change just like every other school. So, you know, we, uh, in March of last year, we went to um, uh, totally virtual learning. And to me, that was actually an interesting experience because um, I really needed to learn how to engage with the students online. Um, you know, you didn't have the same kind of engagement. So I needed to find ways to uh, really get them excited about the learning. So I changed my approach almost entirely. And I started using creative challenges that you know used uh, materials they could use at home um, and I really focused on social emotional learning and creativity so those were the two things that I wanted to make sure um, the students were getting and it was really effective because in New York at that time you know we, we had a really high COVID number uh, kids were really stressed out and scared so that was really helpful um, I found it helpful myself you know arts absolutely is a is a great way to cope and sort of express your feelings and I think you know, just the act of sort of putting it down on paper or digitally really helps all of us um, deal with that period of time better, you know, and you have to improvise. So, you know, I'm happily uh, very good with technology and even for someone that is, uh, you know, used to dealing with different technologies, you know, we, we had a lot of change. So there's, you know, you can't expect to necessarily um, be as effective as you always have. You know, you, there's a little bit more experimentation, but with that comes growth. And I think, you know, the 
silver lining to all of it is that I've learned to engage students uh, in new ways and I've learned to use new tools that I've never used before. So really, you know, there's some benefits that have come out of this period. Can we just maybe back up and talk about what are, where does your school stand as far as, are they fully remote, hybrid, or a little of both, or do you have students in school? Yes, currently I'm in school now. So we are, uh, right now we're hybrid. Um, and initially we were hybrid with, you know, uh, half the students um, coming on A and B days and we do that kind of swap like many schools do. Uh, so we are learning all five days. Um, so I'm in school all five days. Um, and we just recently transitioned to live streaming, which has been uh, a little bit easier. I, I've liked the live stream. Um, it's a little bit awkward, of course, teaching kids in class while you're teaching them at home. So you have to make some alterations. Um, but, you know, if you think of it slightly differently and, you know, like you're putting on an entertainment show every day, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it works pretty well. So, so far that's worked pretty, pretty well for us. And are you using Zoom? Is that? No, we're using uh, the Google platform. So we're using Google Meets with Google Classroom integrated. And are you finding that's been doing what you want it to do? And it's... For the most part, I, you know, some of the things that I really want to do is, you know, be able to collaborate. So you have to work around some things, but, you know, even using tools just like Google Docs or, you know, Jamboards and things like that, allow some collaboration for students at home and at school. The creative challenges have helped because everyone's doing the same thing at the same time. So the same limited materials sort of help. Um, and, you know, you're not going to be able to teach the way that you have traditionally. Um, so you just have to be more open to what's happening. Um, and I, I have found that the, the live streaming has been fairly effective. Like you, the students are engaged and we are, uh, you know, with art, you're really able to see visually um, how the students are doing. So that, that's helpful as a, you know, a sort of a tool to kind of get a, a better sense of um, not just the students learning, but the students uh, engagement and how they're feeling. Do you feel, kind of with my intro, I alluded to this, do you feel that arts are, and in and, and this time in particular, kind of bringing people together? Is it inspiring, you know, from a school standpoint or even just outside of the school doors? Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about art is that it's like, you know, it could be a, a tool of connection and, and communication. So I think it has been really beneficial. Um, you know, even, uh, you're able to share on social media the work that students are doing and uh, you know especially being able to find interesting ways to collaborate with different people because basically every school is online in some form now uh, you're able to collaborate with schools around the world so that's been beneficial um, and you're able to sort of one of the things that I did is you know I, I mentioned that we focus on social emotional learning one of the things I asked students to do was share the tools that work for them like you know how are you coping um, and I think we're all in that same position, whether you're a teacher or a student now, and that we need, you know, to find coping tools. So I, that sort of thing is really effective because when you're sharing out what works for you, I think it's helpful to everybody. You mentioned Jamboard. I'm, I'm going to throw this question kind of off the cuff. Jamboard is a great tool, and if, if educators out there haven't checked it out yet, it's a great kind of one of Google's apps. It's, it's meant to go with the board, but it really can be a standalone and it's a collaboration tool. What are, what are, besides Jamboard, are there other collaborative tools that you've been able to use or just digital tools in art that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean like, uh, you know, so we like the Procreate app is really nice because not only do you create great work, but you're able to make the process into a GIF um, or a short film and you're actually able to share your whole process and I think that's valuable. So we certainly use that. Um, you know, we use a lot of different, uh, collaboration way. So like one of the things I, I do is I'll open up a Google Doc uh, and we'll brainstorm together um, and then we'll use the Jamboard to actually draw out things. Um, and so that's a great like way to introduce something and then we use some tools like uh, the Morphe app is really good um, and uh, there's uh, a, a few different um, you know we have like uh, our clubs are all virtual now so we're, we're working with some colleges who have some other platforms. Um, so like the Savannah College of Art and Design has allowed us to actually come into some of their classes 
So students get the actual college experience and do virtual field trips, um, you know, in their museums and with their college classes, and that's been really beneficial. Uh, and then I've been experimenting with new tools um, because I think that, you know, we've been able to collaborate uh, pretty well, but I'd like to even, you know, go further with it. And there's really no sense of how long the pandemic will last or what's going to happen next. So I think we have license to sort of experiment more than we have before. And I think that's, you know, valuable in education because it will probably move education forward. Um, so I've just been experimenting with lots of new tools. So, you know, I kind of will uh, offer them up to the students with choice based lessons uh, that like, you know, let's try out this app. Like, you know, today we were using machine learning. So, you know, Google has the Google experiments. Um, so we were finding different ways to kind of collaborate with some of those experiments. Yeah, it really is a time, I think, for kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit. And uh, I, again, I think that arts is perfect for, for pushing boundaries. Um, so tell me about uh, your book. I, I did see your video where you said you used Morphe to create the 3D <laughs> design of your book, which was really cool. That's, that was a cool little trick from the video. And I, I just downloaded Morphe to check that out. I hadn't heard of that one before. So tell me about the book. So I, I was really excited. I mean, like, um, you know, I've been doing STEAM forever, even before I was aware the, of the acronym. Um, <laughs> because as an artist, I'm interested in other subjects. So like, you know, I'm interested in science, I'm interested in math uh, and engineering. So it was really a great opportunity to explore, uh, you know, some of the lessons that have really worked for me, some of the projects that are the most engaging, and also talk about the kind of things that you need to uh, establish in order to have a good STEAM environment. So you know, the mindset talking about creativity and talking about collaboration and uh, talking about curiosity and how to deal with failure. Um, so basically I took all of this knowledge that I've sort of built up over the last 22 years of teaching this material and, and found a way to sort of pack it into like one book. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of the things that I've been doing for the last 20 or so years um, with some of the favorite projects and, you know, I want a resource that has everything, um, you know, because like teachers don't have that much time to read. So I wanted to make sure I made it really palatable where you could, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, it's plain spoken. I think it's, a, it's an easy read, even though there's a lot of information in there. Um, and it's just a resource that should be, uh, you know, lasting. So it's not the kind of thing, even though we're dealing with a lot of technologies, they're not technologies. These are not projects that, you know, would, would, disappear with the technology. There are things that are elastic that could uh, really work in any setting. Because I didn't want to exclude anyone. I wanted to make sure that, you know, elementary teachers could use it and high school teachers and even college teachers. So like anyone could use these tools. I made them very uh, open. And you can get the book, uh, Amazon, Kindle? Absolutely, yeah. And right. It's available anywhere books are sold. Uh, and of course at ISTE and uh, I have an Amazon page now as well. And it's important to know that it's um, it's not just art. It's not just an art book, right? It it can it crosses all curriculum areas. Yeah, you know, it's not even really an art book, uh, in a sense. Like, you know, I'm an artist and I, I use art, but I love collaborating with other uh, teachers. So it's really for everyone that isn't an art teacher uh, to learn ways that you could bring some of these creative exercises into the things that you do. You know, because as art teachers, like we're we're often uh, collaborating with other departments, you know, but, you know, different um, uh, subject matter have, have different um, uh, limitations, uh, you know, certainly testing and, and things like that. And, you know, you might not have as much time available. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that I gave enough that um, regardless of what subject you teach uh, and, and what setting you're teaching it, there's, there's enough there that's valuable for you. So I want to kind of ask a two-part question. One is, tell me about just your art as a creator. Tell me what, where your interests lie there. And then kind of pull that back to teaching. And, and how do you get, again, this is, you know, I was an elementary teacher. So I, I, I felt like, you know, there was a, a set curriculum that I worked through. <laughs> but how do you pull that, you know, creativity out of your students? How do you get them to think in new ways? Um, so I guess two parts, your art, and then talk about getting kids to create their own yeah. path voice. 
you know, I think it's related in a lot of ways because, you know, I share my creative process, like, you know, when I'm making pieces with the students and I, I get to show them and sort of model some of that creativity and that's really helpful. So as an artist, like I started out very traditional, you know, doing like uh, portraits uh, that were like photo likeness. Um, and then, you know, I sort of learned to open up and be more expressive. And I went to the school uh, for photography and film. Um, so I learned that sort of side of it. Um, and then as a teacher, really, you end up uh, touching on all of these different parts of the art. So as I learned more and more, I brought it into my own art. Um, and that was really beneficial. So I became basically a multimedia artist. So like I'll do some film pieces and, you know, I'll write plays and, you know, have video elements and, you know, work painting into it. So like I, I really work in every single artistic discipline. Um, and I share all that with the students. Um, and one of the things that I found as a teacher is that really the limitations can help inspire creativity. So um, if you ask people to be creative in class, it's really challenging, you know, like, you know, it, it's hard to be creative on call. But um, I find that if you give them limitations, you know, if you ask them to do a drawing, but they can't use their hands, if you ask them, you know, to create a sculpture, but they can't use any art materials, um, it does force that creativity uh, and it really allows them to flourish because it's a challenge and then they can answer it. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that's also fun and engaging and that's helpful too, I think. Oftentimes you have to face a mindset problem because, you know, students have, uh, when, when you hear creativity, you often think of drawing and, you know, some people don't, aren't comfortable with their skill level. Um, but it's a skill. It's a skill that anyone could learn. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more to art than drawing. And I think that's an important thing to understand um, that even some of the most famous artists are not good at drawing. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been beneficial. And one of the things that I always look at as a teacher that I want to accomplish is that I make sure that every student that comes into my class uh, really has some understanding of how creativity and art can help them in their life even if they're not gonna be an artist. Um, and it's nice when you have students come back after 20 years and they're working you know, for business and they end up getting paid more because they know Photoshop or you know, they, they do painting on the side because they love it. Or you know, it's those sort of stories that, that really uh, show how successful it is. To kind of follow up on that, do you think, it seems to me, again, looking from kind of the outside in and as a technology integrator kind of person, it seems like there's some real avenues for an artistic person who knows Adobe, <laughs> all of the Adobe, you know, the Adobe products or 3D design. It seems like the world is your oyster knowing those and there's some really great opportunities. Not that everything needs to be about money per se, but there's some good careers that will pay well in the arts with, with digital design, I, I, yeah? Yeah, no question. Yeah, and it's kind of, they're not just, you know, well-paying careers, but they're really rewarding. I mean, I have students um, that have gone into, like, you know, because we deal a lot with emerging technologies. So students really in high school have a, an advantage that they end up going into the college and into the marketplace knowing a lot more because they're using it a little bit earlier. Um, and I like to experiment with technologies that, you know, I don't even know that well. So, you know, I wanted to play with code and I said, like, you know, we should learn how to make an app. I have no idea how to do that you know, but I saw a TED talk with a seven-year-old that did it, so we could figure it out. Um, and sort of that learning process of just tackling something you're not even that familiar with and, you know, navigating the way through it is, is a valuable asset. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think uh, there's, there's so many interesting jobs out there. And it's weird because arts have, you know, a, a reputation for, you know, people not getting work, I think traditionally. Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is like, you know, if you look at the alumni that I have versus some other departments, it's like, you know, you know, I have five or six students working at Disney and, you know, a couple of working on the new Star Wars movie. And, you know, that's exciting. They're getting to do all these different jobs from augmented reality to, you know, digital design and drawing. And, you know, uh, they're even touching on like, you know, I someone that worked at Little Bits helping design some of the pieces. There, there's all of these avenues that didn't exist before. So it's very exciting, I think. Yeah, that's really where I was kind of going with that is that, you know, the stereotypical starving artist in the past, you know, is really 
now is the time where the arts have, have can be rewarded not just for appreciation but um, as career options so I think that's really exciting and it sounds like you're setting your students up for that uh, absolutely for just that so let's talk about um, you know as as hopefully the smoke clears from all of this you you, you kind of hinted at this already where do you see education going after this is done or where do you see it you know even now are there some things that are really going to come out of this that are going to be hopefully sticking and uh you know thoughts on thoughts on the future of education you know it's one of the most interesting aspects of the pandemic you know because it's been really challenging for people and it's it's been a real game changer i don't you know it's one of those things that it has led to so much change that it will ultimately have some backlash, I think. But but in the bigger picture, I think there's there's uh, some terrific progress that's going to be made, especially with integrating technology. Because you know, like every school really needed, like every teacher became a technology teacher in March, whether they wanted to or not. So you know, it's really pushed the needle forward in a lot of ways. Not everyone necessarily uh, tackled it in a way that was productive. So I think that you know, there's there were some learning pains, and I think that's probably still happening in lots of places. Um, but everyone has a new appreciation for the tools. I think there's no question about that. Um, and I think, you know, education was in desperate need of a change because we were still living in this industrial system of, you know, like traditional classrooms. And I think that, like, it, it really, you know, was long overdue to have some kind of large change. And, you know, sometimes, um, you know, something like a pandemic will, will make that happen. It's oftentimes like, you know, these negative things that have positive changes in the big picture. Um, so I think education will certainly change a lot. I, I can't quite tell the direction, but I could certainly say in terms of an art teacher that used a lot of technology, that you see other art teachers who were resistant, you know, now sort of coming on. Um, and as this progresses, I think that people will have a greater appreciation for good technology tools that are effective. And, you know, you see some of these groups like, you know, Zoom and, and uh, Google certainly adjusting their products really quickly because they had to. Um, so I've never seen the turnarounds uh, in technology happen so quickly either. So, you know, it's an opportunity for designers for educational tools uh, to really get in the game in a different way as well. So I think we'll probably also see some new tools come out of this that will actually aid teaching. Um, and of course, you know, ultimately, the most important thing in education is the learning, the student learning. Um, so I think that initially, you know, there was sort of a lag because when the switch to virtual teaching happened, you know, it came with a lot of teachers that weren't comfortable with that. And, um, you know, uh, students weren't necessarily engaged in the same way or learning at the same depth. Um, and assessments basically went out the window <laughs> for a lot of schools. Um, but I think we're catching up now and sort of learning to connect with students in a meaningful way using these technology resources. Really well put. I agree with that. So let's talk about your upcoming projects. Have anything, you finish one book, does that make you want to <laughs> take it? <laughs> Start another one? Uh, yeah, what are you, projects? It doesn't have to be a book, it could be any. Anything. Well, you know, I, I, um, when I was writing my book, I, I wrote so much that I have a whole second book, basically. <laughs> so, like, I'm working on editing that now because there's nothing like a pandemic for writing, honestly. It's a great, <laughs> a great opportunity because there's not that much else to do. So, um, and I'm presenting a lot at virtual conferences because um, I was comfortable with the technology, so it was easier for me to do. Um, so, you know, like, even in the last uh, in this fall, I have 20 virtual conferences that I'm presenting, which is terrific. Wow. Um, and then I'm working with uh, Adobe and National Geographic to create some online classes uh, for teachers. So they have a partnership uh, that I'm working with um, to create free classes for educators uh, in some of these things, uh, design and, uh, you know, I, we, I just finished working with them um, on uh, infographics uh, and, you know, they have one in photography. So there's some exciting things. I'm working with Adobe. Uh, they have a creativity uh, education program uh, that's been really fun. Cool. Yeah, I'm amazed at what Adobe does. I think when people hear that word, they just think, you know, 
reader, <laughs> Adobe yep. reader, but, but they have a suite of, of tools that are really top of the line, first rate. You can do almost anything with them. Absolutely. All right. Well, we are now at the time for the Speed Geek question. So these are three to five quick short answer, can be whimsical. And I'm going to use my uh, Wheel Decide Now app on my iPad. So. <laughs> Again, feel free to have some fun with these. Uh, we kind of already did this one, but actually I think you could take a little twist. So if you could design your own school, what would it look like? You know, I've been wanting to do this my entire life. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I, I, one of the things I would really love to do if I have my own school is to not have different subjects to teach together all project-based learning. Um, I think that, uh, you know, when you silo education into different subjects, uh, it limits some of what you could do. And I really love, as a creative, curious person, you know, learning everything at the same time uh, in project-based learning. What about design-wise, the design of a school? Would you tear down the walls? What would, you, what would it you look know, like? One of, the, one of my favorite projects to do with my classes is to redesign our classroom. Um, so we've been doing that over the years. And as we do that, less and less of the traditional classroom is there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that the, the best scenario is like, you know, you want a comfortable and creative environment. So we look at places like Google and Adobe and these uh, environments that are built for creativity. Um, and they tend to be colorful and fun and not look anything like a school. So <laughs> more like a cafe uh, is, is usually the, the easier way to go. That's a good way to look at it. Okay. Uh, so. We all know as teachers, students inspire us, but who or what inspires you beyond students? What are your inspirations? Um, I'm inspired all the time. I mean, like, you know, I'm a big, um, uh, I love film. So, you know, I'm always watching uh, films and, you know, Netflix has probably become one of the go-to companies through the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I'm always inspired by different things. I watch documentaries, especially. Um, uh, and uh, of course I'm uh, big on social media. So, you know, I have a, a so many uh, colleagues on Twitter that share some amazing resources and Instagram. Um, and then, uh, you know, as an artist, I'm always looking at, you know, the, uh, the artists and sort of like what's happening around the world. So uh, it's really interesting, especially when you see people pushing the envelope and uh, playing with media in different ways. So there's like a, an artist, uh, Raphael uh, Hemmer, um, that is a scientist that became an artist and uses science in all of his artworks. Uh, so he has a piece named Pulse where, you know, it, it takes the pulse of your finger and then makes it into an artwork projected on the wall. And so I'm always inspired by people sort of pushing the envelope uh, of creativity. Nice. All right, we'll go with our last one here. Uh, what is your favorite app? I know this is probably the toughest question of all right now. Yeah, <laughs> that's so hard. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of Morphe and I'm a big fan of uh, Procreate. My favorite app. Oh, geez. Um, well, you know, um, I'll say like currently it's Procreate um, just because um, I am an artist that traditionally always worked in a sketchbook, a paper sketchbook. And, you know, I've transitioned to uh, drawing digitally just because I'm living digitally these days. Um, and it allows me to share the process of creating my work. Um, and share out, you know, videos, uh, which is a little bit more engaging sometimes than uh, just 2D artwork. Um, and I find that I'm using it for everything. So for social media posts, and then I'm also using it for drawing. And, you know, one of the things that's helped me a lot during this pandemic is having a journal of, you know, sort of what's going on in my life. And I find that I've been doing that digitally on Procreate. And that's been one of the most effective tools for me because it's, uh, helps manage the stress and it's also fun and feel productive. Great, procreate. All right, we'll look that one up. <laughs> All right, well, Tim, you're doing really just great stuff on the front lines of education as well as outside of that in, in, in your cultural realm as well. And um, look forward to seeing your, your uh, work uh, at ISTE. And uh, I'm gonna get a copy of your book too. What is the name of your book one last time? Uh, Steam Power. Awesome. All right, well, Tim, uh, great meeting you and look forward to uh, hopefully connecting in the future. Absolutely, thank you.